Welcome to the top 12 highlights of chapter one from the Magleby text. Mr. Rodman with you, taking you through the highlights of the constitutional democracy. What does it mean? It means that we are looking for a government that includes uh, the elected officials of uh, the people that have elected them, the representative politicians. Uh, they are winning elections that are free and fair. Uh, that are uh, in many ways direct uh, elections elected by the people and their parties uh, and independents and, and uh, other voters uh, that are electing them to office, uh, be that on the national, state, or local level. We're also looking at power that's fragmented on those levels, that national, state, and local level. And also uh, that elected officials are trying to build coalitions in order to find compromise, in order to find uh, policies like the one uh, that President Trump and the uh, Democratic leadership uh, formed yesterday. Uh, that's exactly what the uh, founders were looking for in a constitutional democracy, um, being able to build coalitions across the aisle, so to speak, across Democrat the Democratic and party uh, and Republican party lines. So is this perfection? Hardly, uh, but the idea is it's not perfection. That was the point that um, the um, the founders were trying to make, Madison and Jefferson, really looking at this constitutional democracy as a work in progress, that change will need to be made, but, uh, but that it will be made and uh, that along the way it will be adjusted and and in order to make it better. Now let's talk about direct versus representative democracy. Direct democracy, all of the people vote on everything. A representative democracy, otherwise we would call that, we would call that a pure democracy as well, a direct or a pure democracy, uh, when everybody's voting on everything. But obviously that's very time consuming. Uh, to get everybody in a room would be next to impossible. How do 311 million people across the country vote on everything? So we have a representative democracy as part of the consent of the governed. Magleby talks about the idea that we consent to be governed, uh, to have representatives that we elect to be our leaders who will pass laws that then we will have to follow. That's the idea of they are representing us, and that's a part of that representative democracy. Now, at the state level, uh, we have some uh, types of direct democracy that are in play. We have a direct primary. Uh, if you are a member of a party, and in Maryland you have to be a member of a party, it is a closed primary, so um, as opposed to an open one where you can basically go in and select uh, a Democratic ballot or a Republican ballot and, and vote that way. New Hampshire uh, would have that, Ohio, Indiana, others uh, have that type of primary. Uh, the, it is still direct, but it's a close. Uh, excuse me, but it's an open, uh, direct open primary. We have a direct closed primary, meaning you have to be a registered member of that party in order to get a ballot uh, to vote in that direct primary. And in a direct primary. Uh, the members of the party or the people in an open direct primary, uh, those people are nominating party candidates for that office. So you are electing, uh, basically nominating people who will then run for election in the general election in November. So this would be a primary election. The general election would be held in November. The primary uh, in Maryland has been held in the spring, but I believe the one coming up next year would be held in September. Uh, so the uh, that would be the direct close primary in Maryland. An initiative is basically a petition. That's that clipboard that you sign outside the grocery store, uh, outside the uh, Home Depot, in which somebody's asking you to sign on to something. Uh, one of the, the most uh, popular initiative petitions we had in recent years uh, was was casino gambling, uh, the idea of adding slot machines uh, to uh, to bring gambling to Maryland in order to help raise tax revenue, which is always a popular way to get something passed. Uh, and uh, as a result, it started out as an initiative petition. It was put to referendum, uh, which is the next step. And basically the state legislature, the General Assembly, decided to put it to referendum, which is basically putting it on the ballot. Uh, there were enough initiative petition signatures to do that. And as a result, uh, the referendum uh, was passed in 2012 that basically uh, gave uh, Casino gambling, actually, the, the 2012 uh, measure actually expanded casino gambling. I believe it was 2008 originally uh, that brought the slot machines, and 2012 expanded uh, the, the gambling to include table games and expanded to include uh, an additional re uh, uh, casino resource uh, in Baltimore. So that's referendum. Recall uh, is something uh, that we don't have here, but uh, you'll see it in a place like California, for instance, in which uh, the most... Um, 
the most recent uh, news was recalling uh, Governor Gray Davis back during the energy crisis, uh, and, and Arnold Schwarzenegger was elected as a result of, of that after that recall election. But basically, it's when the voters uh, sign an initiative petition and basically put it on the ballot to recall an elected official, to basically say, mm, no, we're, we're, we don't want that elected official in office after all. So that's a recall. And uh, if it passes, uh, the person is removed. And in the case of California, Gray Davis, uh, the sitting governor at the time, was removed from office. Now, uh, Scott Walker in Wisconsin, the governor there, uh, faced a recall petition, uh, but it actually was voted down. Uh, the, he was able to uh, fight off a recall, a, a, a momentum of recall in that state. Um, let's talk about the forms of government for a second, because we always think of democracy, uh, but we, there are other ones out there. Autocracy, basically the idea of one leader, um, and oligarchy, the idea of a, a small group of leaders. Uh, so an oligarch would be a small group of people. We see this with the, the uh, Central Committee in, in China that basically is running um, – a communist government uh, in a small group. It's the, the, the central committee that is made up of uh, members of various parts of society, but the idea is it's an oligarch. It's a small group of people that make all the decisions. An autocracy, uh, we, we see this in totalitarian governments, uh, in which the uh, there's one leader and a dictator, uh, probably a more, more common term that we use. We have the democracy, the democratic form of government, the idea here that uh, we have representative government, uh, consent of the governed, and the idea is we elect those leaders through representative government. And if we don't like them, uh, in the next election, we vote for somebody else. We don't have to. Uh, we don't have to keep them. Uh, we can decide to elect new leaders. So um, in this idea of um, some of the other forms of government that we see, uh, we have a monarchy, which is a king or a queen, uh, most famous one being the English government, um, which is more of a um more ceremonial today than anything, but an absolute monarch uh, would be someone who rules and basically creates the laws, changes the laws, and basically it's it's that type of autocracy we were talking about. A constitutional monarchy is more what you see today, and England has this type of monarchy, uh, in which the government shares power with parliament, an elected body of, of lawmakers, but the idea here is that you have uh, a monarch that is pretty much a figurehead. Uh, they are part of the government. People bow and they open they open parliament. Uh, the queen comes in the ceremonial robes and the tiara and opens the um, opens the parliament each year. But really, parliament is the one who uh, passes a budget, which includes a paycheck to the queen and and her family for uh, their ceremonial duties. And uh, but really, the the majority of the the power is actually here in the uh, in the parliament, not in the uh, monarch. And then a totalitarian dictatorship, very similar to the autocracy we were talking about, um, can be an oligarchy as well, uh, the totalitarian. But the idea is they have total control. They're the ones that pass the laws. They're the ones that change the laws. Uh, they're the ones that decide uh, if and when any elections, if any, uh, would be held. And, uh, and they would control all of those, those uh, pieces of government. Now, uh, what do we hold dear in a democracy, and why do we see it uh, as, as something that our values that, that we hold uh, to be um, so reverential? Um, we value, and, and these are things that, that, whether you're Democrat, Republican, Independent, uh, leaning to the left, leaning to the right, or whatever, um, we tend to hold dear as a society. Uh, so this is much larger. This is part of our political culture, um, not just uh, focused on ideology, ideological views. Uh, but the idea here is that personal liberty is something that we value. Um, Republicans will look at this in terms of personal liberty means government taxes me less and I have less government in my life. Personal liberty for a Democrat would mean uh, something like uh, personal liberty in terms of my right to choose whether to have an abortion or uh, whether to burn a flag as part of my free speech. So um, they look at it differently in terms of their ideological views, but the value itself uh, is something that we hold dear. Individual, individualism would be something similar. Uh, the individualism of, of being able to uh, start a business without being encumbered by lots of rules and regulations. Republicans would be supportive of that. Individualism to a Democrat uh, would look at it in terms of uh, I have the right to um, – I have the right uh, to to speak out and and attend a protest and uh, participate 
in uh, in some type of a, a protest of political free speech, or uh, as I mentioned, some of the social issues of the day. Uh, the right to individualism is the right to marry the person that you love, regardless of of uh, their gender. And uh, so these are the values we hold dear, but how we uh, apply those values to our ideologies are different, and we'll get to that when we get to Unit 2 in looking at political beliefs and behaviors. Equality of opportunity, again, uh, we look at that in terms of uh, how Republicans and Democrats may view, may differ in their views in terms of how it's applied, but the idea is that equality of opportunity is a value we hold dear. Uh, and then popular sovereignty, that idea that uh, the 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 people have spoken and the continue the people continue to speak on what is important to them. This is where our democracy comes from. This is where the source of that uh, of, of that freedom uh, that we talk about so much comes from. And then in terms of uh, what do we hold dear as far as a part of keeping the democratic movement going that de that, that democracy and democratic little d not democratic as in uh, the Democratic Party but democracy in terms of a republican form of government a representative form of government. Um, and democratic in terms of holding free and fair elections, uh, that the majority rules, that we aren't ruled uh, by the minority uh, that is exercising power over the majority. Um, but the idea here is that um, there is there is a majority uh, in in terms of the um, in terms of the size and scope of of what the government is doing. There is support behind it, uh, and that's when we get into things like polling and polls uh, that we'll also look at in Unit Two in terms of those beliefs. Free expression, the uh, again the the differences in terms of how that shapes out in in ideological format, but free expression in terms uh, of a a part of our democracy uh, that we see as vital to can to maintaining that uh, that openness of, of, a, of a democratic government, little d. Uh, then the right to assemble and protest under the Bill of Rights, uh, very important there as well. Political structures that we see in our democracy, well, federalism, we'll talk about that more in Chapter 3, but it's the idea of, of this sharing of power, national, state, and local governments all working together, which is very different than separation of powers. I don't want you to confuse the two. Federalism, the idea we have uh, a handshake, if you will, of, of national government that is working with the state government, that is working with the local government. We saw that with Hurricane Harvey we're in Texas and in Houston. We're seeing that with Hurricane Irma in Florida. The Florida government is working with the Miami, uh, Florida, the, the city of Miami government, which is working with the national government to make sure that everything is, uh, everything is at their disposal in terms of resources and help to keep people out of harm's way, to make sure that everyone uh, is as well protected as possible. Separation of powers, that no part of government controls all of the power, but it is separated into distinct distinct and separate powers, that the, na that the national government includes um, a legislative branch that makes the laws, a, an executive branch that, that uh, enforces the laws, and a judicial branch that interprets those laws, and that we have those separate and distinct measures of those powers that are so important uh, to making sure that no one or small group um, has all of the power and concentrates that power to use it in a negative way. Bicameralism, two chambers. We have a Congress, a legislature that has an upper house and a lower house, very similar to parliament in Great Britain. Uh, we have a, a an upper house, which is called the Senate. We have a lower house, the House of Representatives, and it is bicameral, by uh, la Latin, uh, for two, cameral, Latin for chamber, two chambers of this legislative body. And uh, they may not always agree. Uh, and we, we see this oftentimes. The House will pass something and the Senate won't. The House passed uh, a bill to uh, repeal Obamacare and uh, re repeal and replace Obamacare. It didn't pass the Senate, never even came close uh, to passing in the Senate uh, in, its, in its similar format from the House. And one of the things we will learn in Unit 4 is that in order for a bill to go to the president's desk, it has to be an identical bill signed by both the House and, or excuse me, approved by both the House and the Senate majorities. And if it doesn't, uh, it's not going anywhere. So in that case, the House bill, while they celebrated at the White House uh, on the repeal and replace of Obamacare, um, they, it went nowhere in the Senate, so the president never got a bill to sign. So while they celebrated, uh, it really was kind of putting cart before horse because it was a little too early to celebrate that when, um, when the bill never uh, had a chance of, of making it in the Senate. Checks and balances, we'll go into more detail there. That's the, the check and balance that uh, that each individual um, 
uh, body such as the legislative branch and the, the executive branch and the judicial branch has to make sure that the other one doesn't get too much power, to more power than the other. Uh, and so they're checking and balancing each other. And then we have the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution that are so critical in terms of uh, making sure that those individual freedoms are protected uh, at the not just the uh, state level but also at the national level. Now here we get into the natural rights and the uh, European philosophers that really impacted and um, and really influenced the, the founders and framers of our, our government and our constitution uh, in terms of their thought process. The idea here was uh, that there was a, a higher power uh, the, in which um, people uh, were had to be um, people had to be ruled by government, uh, but the government was um, was given, uh, in some cases, given by God uh, in, in some of these uh, these religious settings, uh, these European philosophers looking at it as, as uh, natural rights, as rights given to the people by a higher power, not by government, uh, but given to them uh, by 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 something, something higher and bigger than government that government couldn't take away. And the important piece there is that those rights are natural. Uh, and we'll look at the, the, the pieces of that in just a second. But some of these included life, liberty, and property. Uh, this would be changed to the pursuit of happiness. But the idea here was that they were natural rights. They were unalienable. You couldn't just take them away. You couldn't just uh, chop them off and, and think that they didn't matter. Uh, and this was the importance. And this is actually why George Mason and Patrick Henry were so uh, we're so adamant that a Bill of Rights was necessary when the Constitution was was adopted and and approved by the states. They didn't think uh, that enough of these natural rights were protected in the Constitution, and they wanted to make sure it was spelled out uh, in the first ten amendments, uh, twelve that were proposed, but the ten that ended up being approved um, were protected, uh, making sure uh, that the uh, the members of society uh, were protected by these rights, and uh, that was a, a critical component uh, that really fueled uh, the momentum behind George Mason and uh, Patrick Henry to get Madison on board with with changing the um, with amending the, the Constitution in order to get it approved uh, so one of the things we see here is the idea that um, we have uh, Thomas Hobbes uh, looking at the state of nature in terms of uh, constantly uh, humans constantly being at war. Uh, this was a different environment. It was a different setting, and the idea here was um, that there was uh, there would be a, a contract to achieve peace, and government, some form of government, would be needed for that because uh, the the idea. The idea behind it was that man was was essentially poor, nasty, brutish, uh, and uh, couldn't uh, govern himself. And uh, that was really what why a, a social contract, if you will, was needed. Locke came along and said uh, this, and kind of formalized this idea of the social contract, and said uh, not only is it a social contract, but it's a social contract to make sure that these inalienable, the, these unalienable rights are uh, are not taken away by government. That that this life, liberty, and estate, uh, the natural rights that he talked about, uh, and it, mind you, this was you know almost a hundred years prior to. Uh, Jefferson and, and Madison uh, picking it up, but the idea was that um, no one could take away those rights, and government would would institute a social contract in order to help um, in order to to help keep man from being nasty and brutish, as as Hobbes talked about. Uh, but it was a contract that could easily be adjusted or or taken away uh, in, in, if government didn't do what they were supposed to do. So the power was in the hands of the people, not in the hands of government. Uh, and that contract could be changed uh, to change government uh, if man felt that life, liberty, and a state was being threatened. Then we have Montesquieu that said, not only do we need to, to look at this social contract in terms of limiting the power of government, we also need to limit the 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 power of government within itself, the checks on power. What we would see as checks and balances today um, came from these views of Montesquieu in terms of making sure that if we have a separate legislative, executive, and judicial branch, uh, we want to make sure that none of them become more powerful than the other. So there needed to be a check and balance in order to keep that power in check so that government wouldn't break out of its uh, social contract with the people and become more, so powerful that the people uh, still didn't have their right to life, liberty, and estate. 
Um, and that's what uh, essentially led to this idea of separate powers, the legislative branch, the executive branch, the judicial branch, uh, and focused on these separate but equal uh, powers in nature and the checks and balances that support that. Uh, Rousseau, meanwhile, uh, came along with this, uh, with this idea. And what Rousseau was trying to say is, now we have a social contract, but we also need to keep in mind that we're giving up something in order to have the social contract and the concern is is it going to impact those those rights of life liberty and, and estate life liberty and, and property and so we by giving a social contract we create essentially rousseau is talking about this idea of consent of the governed uh this idea of of basically agreeing to elect leaders that then will form our government and pass laws over us that then we will have to follow. So we're giving up something in order to get something in return. What do we get as a result of it? Well, hopefully we get this social contract of, uh, of, of a government that is going to keep the peace to keep, uh, as Hobbes said, this nasty, poor and brutish environment of barbaric uh, nature uh, that, that people have, but also to ensure uh, that those natural rights are protected, uh, that, that the ideas uh, inherent in life, liberty, and property uh, are protected and that, um, that no government can take that away or we can change the social contract. And that was really important here because one of the, the key pieces of this government uh, that would show the problems of the Articles of Confederation was Shays Rebellion. Uh, all of a sudden, you have a problem in which no central government, no national government has any power to do anything uh, in order to put down this uprising. Now, luckily, uh, the, the states can step in, but uh, the states are going to have to work together. And what it really uh, shown to many of the founders uh, and framers was that we needed a national government that had more power than we had under the Articles of Confederation, uh, which is what led to that Second Continental Congress uh, in Philadelphia. Because if we had a national scale or national scope of Shays' Rebellion, uh, think slavery for a moment and a, a potential civil war, um, how would the national government put that down? Could we get the states to all agree on that? And they weren't confident that that was the case. So that is what led to that, that constitutional convention in Philadelphia uh, to go in and fix the articles. They weren't intending to throw it all out, uh, that's, even though that's what they ended up doing. But the problem was the, the Articles of Confederation were too weak. Uh, they needed a government to be able um, to uh, have some checks in place, uh, thus the national, state, and local government uh, aspect of, of, of basically sharing the, the power among the levels of government, but also making sure that it was powerful enough to tax and create an army, form an army, to basically withstand something like a civil war, uh, you know, kind of looking ahead to what, what might happen, uh, obviously not knowing what would happen you know, by 1860, uh, but the idea there was they needed a stronger central government. And so that's what led to uh, this constitutional convention and uh, the, the founders uh, meeting once again in Philadelphia to scrap the articles and build uh, Madison's, uh, the, the father of the constitution, uh, to basically craft a, a, a constitution that included articles uh, that focused on these legislative, executive, and judicial branches that focused on uh, changing how the uh, constitution is amended. It's not going to be unanimous as it was under the articles. Uh, you need nine of 13 colonies and, um, and a bicameral legislature on this, on this national scope that is going to represent large states and small states. It's going to represent slave states and non-slave states. And it's going to find ways to compromise uh, with the various factions that are out there in order to make sure that government maintains those natural rights that John Locke talked about, but to keep, as Hobbes said, uh, society from becoming barbaric and becoming more problematic uh, than uh, than it, it uh, than it was at the moment. So those compromises uh, led to the Connecticut or Great Compromise. We have a house uh, that is basically elected um, through the idea that um, the number of of seats is based on population uh, and and representative as such. So every house district across the country is of the same 
equal uh, representative uh, population, but the Senate is equal across the states. So there are two senators for every state, and the House is elected by, by population. So that was the compromise they ended up coming up with. Uh, the Electoral College would, would elect the president, not the people. It would not be a direct election of the president. It would be an Electoral College instead, uh, which is as, as you can imagine with the 2016 election in which uh, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote and Donald Trump, the Electoral College, has uh, kind of regenerated that, that debate about scrapping the Electoral College. Um, if you read up on the national popular vote, they talk about this quite a bit in terms of um, – uh, trying to get states to go along with a national popular vote, and we'll see what happens. Uh, there are about 10 states on board with that right now, uh, and if you uh, want to look into that more detail, just Google national popular vote, and you can get more information. Um, they also went to an unlimited re-election uh, in terms of the uh, the four-year term. Uh, now, that obviously would change with the 22nd Amendment after um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, limiting. The 22nd Amendment would limit uh, a president to two full four-year terms or eight of uh, ten years, um, uh, eight years in office uh, in a combination of that, and we can talk about that in more detail and uh, if you have questions. Uh, and then Supreme Court justices would be chosen by the president and confirmed by the Senate. Uh, again, ideas uh, that were out there were that the, the, the Senate would choose them and the president would choose them, and uh, they settled on uh, the justices being chosen by the president, confirmed by the Senate, and this is where the Senate gets their advice and consent um, from the, uh, the advice and consent. Uh, role that they play in not just the justices of the Supreme Court, uh, but any along the circuit courts uh, they would approve, as well as uh, the president's cabinet, the, the heads of the different departments of the bureaucracy. Uh, under the executive branch. So this compromise was was definitely at play here, uh, trying to limit the power of government, limit to, trying to limit the power of the national government in particular uh, by using separation of powers, using checks and balances, uh, using the idea of a national, state, and local government, the federalist, federalism approach, and, um, and using that limited government in that capacity. So uh, that leads to Madison and his role in the Federalist Papers. Madison, John Jay, and Alexander Hamilton uh, would get together to become Publius, uh, the, the anonymous, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, anonymous uh, signing of the Federalist Papers that they would write, basically supporting ratification of the Constitution. And what they saw was uh, that they needed a stronger central government based on Shays' rebellion. They needed a stronger central government, but one that was in check, one that had a check and balance based on it. And George Mason and uh, and and uh, Patrick Henry would look at that as well and say, hey, yeah, we need a uh, we need a stronger government. But we also need one that keeps that government in check to not take away the powers of the people. Uh, and, and the concern there was uh, John Locke's natural rights theory uh, to make sure that they continued to have the natural rights of life, liberty, and property. So what were the anti-federalist main concerns? As I mentioned, uh, they were the, the government would be too strong. Uh, Congress would be too focused on commerce uh, to restrict the states from being able to buy and sell and trade, uh, not just with each other, but also with other governments. Because remember, these were colonies at that point. They were also trying to um, establish trade routes with other nations and, and had those trade uh, routes established. So they didn't want Congress to meddle with that. Uh, so we see the Commerce Clause, in which uh, Congress does a lot more restricting uh, in terms of that today. But back then, uh, there was a lot less focus uh, on on that role. O on the Democratic and Republican side, we see uh, a lot of that discussion today, but it is very different than what it was back uh, in the Founders' Day. Uh, they also co were concerned that the government would be too distant from the people, uh, which is why they put those Bill of Rights, that, that the first 10 amendments of the Constitution in place, and they certainly didn't want to take the power away from the states, uh, which is why those Bill of Rights were amended, because uh, Basically, Patrick Henry and George Mason were calling for another constitutional convention in which they would open up the Constitution and basically throw everything back on the table, and that was the last thing that James Madison wanted to do. He did not want to open up uh, the, another can of worms like the Articles of Confederation and have everybody weighing in, basically tra throwing out the Constitution and basically uh, coming up with another Constitution uh, that they would be having to start all over. So he said, okay, we'll, we'll amend the Constitution. Uh, I, I'm going to get behind these first 
first 10 amendments because the last thing I want is to start over. So uh, that is how we ended up with the first 10 uh, amendments to the Constitution and ultimately the states would ratify, uh, the, would ratify the Constitution and those first 10 amendments. So the, uh, that's where the, the Bill of Rights essentially would come from and, and those powers um, would be in the Constitution essentially as an amendment but really as part of the original Constitution as such. Um, what are those uh, that, we're, that we're talking about here? We're talking about writ of habeas corpus. Uh, you can't suspend uh, the rights, the natural rights of, of those individuals under the Bill of Rights, uh, except in times of invasion or rebellion. Uh, Abraham Lincoln would suspend writ of habeas corpus during uh, the Civil War. Uh, we saw uh, President George Bush uh, suspend writ of habeas corpus uh, after 9-11 uh, to enemy combatants. Uh, so we did see some of that going on as well. They also wanted to prevent Bill of Attainder, basically uh, passing laws by Congress that, that basically focused on particular small groups or groups of people that could be punished. Ex post facto laws, uh, they certainly didn't want you to be punished for something you didn't know was a law, and they were basically making it retroactive to punish someone who didn't know they weren't supposed to wear blue on Tuesday, but they did um, because they didn't weren't aware that the law uh, was going to be passed today. Um, and also, the, uh, the jury trial. Uh, in a criminal case, this would actually be extended to civil cases as well, uh, but the last thing they wanted was for na uh, individual rights to be, uh, to be limited and, and, and not have the capability of a, a trial by jury, a jury of their own peers. Privileges and immunities, to be able to honor those between states uh, and when states issued a driver's license, for instance, or uh, the states honored a contract, that it would be honored uh, by the uh, national government as well as the states. Uh, that there was no religious test for public office. Uh, and 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 still is not. Uh, you do not have to be or not ha uh, uh, have to be uh, a member of a, a particular uh, religious uh, institution or a religion uh, or no religion in order to uh, serve public office. There is no test for that. And contracts, as I mentioned, would be protected. Uh, those state contracts in particular would be protected by the government. Hope you've enjoyed this and found this helpful. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me uh, or see me in room 110. And uh, I know you will do well. Hope this was beneficial. And we'll see you in the top 12 highlights of chapter two next.